The NYPD, the Secret Service, a small army of lawyers, and the more than 500 New Yorkers who were told to report to jury duty on Monday are set to play a part in history, the first ever criminal trial of an ex-American president. Donald Trump, for the next six to eight weeks, will be thrust into a role he has spent his entire life trying to avoid, that of a criminal defendant on trial potentially inching closer and closer and closer to the one thing he fears most, according to his friend Chris Christie. No matter what he says, no matter how he's bragging and, and going on and on about him not being afraid, he goes to bed every night thinking about the sound of that jail cell door climbing, closing behind him. It's a soundbite that'll live forever. Compounding that specific fear, as told to us by his friend Chris Christie, as he sits at the defense table, the ex-president will have to watch many of his closest aides and former advisors and employees lay out in painstaking detail for a jury of 12 what prosecutors allege is an illegal scheme to cover up hush money payments made in order to hide damaging information from becoming public and being known by voters. This is what Judge Mershon will tell potential jurors Monday, quote, the allegations are in substance that Donald Trump falsified business records to conceal an agreement with others to unlawfully influence the 2016 presidential election. Now, much of the evidence in this case is already known to us in the public. There's the tape of Trump talking to Michael Cohen about silencing Karen McDougal, which shows that Trump is deeply involved in a years long scheme to suppress negative stories about himself. I need to open up a company for the transfer of all of that info regarding our friend David. And I spoke to Alan about it when it comes time for the financing, which will be... Listen, what financing? We'll have to pay you, so... Pay the no, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not how you do it. That's not how you silence someone before an election. And then there's Stormy Daniels. You know, Stormy Daniels, she's already come clean about the pressure she faced to stay silent. So you signed and released uh, a statement that said, I'm not denying this affair because I was paid in hush money. I'm denying it because it never happened. That's a lie. Yes. If it was untruthful, why did you sign it? Because they made it sound like I had no choice. The exact sentence used was, they can make your life hell in many different ways. And one of the key witnesses to all aspects of this, Michael Cohen, has already testified on exactly how the scheme works. Here's what he told Congress in 2019. Mr. Trump directed me to use my own personal funds from a home equity line of credit to avoid any money being traced back to him that could negatively impact his campaign. The President of the United States thus wrote a personal check for the payment of hush money as part of a criminal scheme to violate campaign finance laws. All of that, as dramatic and unprecedented and sordid as it is, could be the tip of the iceberg, though. In a brand new interview, Michael Cohen tells Politico that we are going to be surprised by the strength of the evidence. He says this, quote, most people don't really know anything. They only know what the headlines have been. And as you know very, very well, headlines do not necessarily tell the story. The country now on the verge of a watershed moment in American politics in the form of a criminal case against Donald Trump being laid out in a court of law is where we begin today with some of our favorite reporters and friends, all of them at the table today. New York Times reporter Kate Christobeck is here. She was a former assistant district attorney in New York City. We've been relying on your reporting all week about the jury process. We're glad that you're here. Also from the New York Times, political reporter and MSNBC contributor Nick Confessori is here. The host of the On Brand podcast, Donnie Deutsch is back and host of Politics Nation right here on MSNBC. And the president of the National Action Network, the Reverend Al Sharpton, is here. So earlier in the week, you had this great reporting about the, the process for selecting a, a jury. And there's something so startling about how normal the process is. But tell us a little bit more about what exactly will happen on Monday. I mean, that's exactly right. This is an unprecedented moment, but it's also so common. Um, 
on Monday morning, we're going to see hundreds of jurors report to the Manhattan Criminal Courthouse. Some will know exactly the reason they're coming. Others might be surprised when they get there. They're all going to file in. They'll be welcomed by Justice Juan Mershon, who will explain to them parts of the case. And again, it's going to be like any other case, except that the former president will just be sitting feet away from them. Um, he's going to describe to them the the case and ask them point blank right away, do they have any reason that they can't be fair or impartial to the former president? And I think that's when we're really going to see opinions start coming up and how this is very different from your traditional criminal case. I mean, in the context of politics, right, that question is asked to try to deduce who someone's going to vote for. How is that question asked in the context of selecting a fair juror? I think that, first off, I think that the fair and impartial question is initially politically motivated, but the way I think it is asked for jurors across, no matter what case it is, but in this case, it is likely going to elicit opinions that are directed to politics. But the way that Justice Mershon has structured the, the jury selection, the voir dire process, is that even if people don't initially flag that they can't be fair and impartial, there's many questions to come that can try to root that out. And um, as we reported, the questions start out much sim very simple. They're yeah. going to be biographical. And slowly we will move into things that are much more pointed, much more getting at people's individual politics. There's certain things that won't be discussed. They're not going to at any point ask for a per who they voted for in the past, who mm -hmm. they plan to vote for, or a person's political party registration. But they will ask um, have you attended a rally for Donald Trump? Have you um, volunteered for Donald Trump or anyone that would be considered anti to, Don to Donald Trump? So these questions will come up. And I think through admittedly 42 questions that are in the jury questionnaire, they will gradually try to find jurors that can be fair and impartial. It's an Im you know imperfect system. I think right. any lawyer would say that. And it really comes down to how truthful the jurors are as part of this. What will the prosecutors be looking for in a juror? Sure. I think the, through our reporting, you know, we saw that the prosecutors are, they have come out and said that they really believe they would just want a fair and impartial jury. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that they would certainly like to find people who are um, likely interested in the news, watch the news, or mm -hmm. into media, media consumption. I think they're also going to likely try to find people who are highly educated, very along the lines of maybe people who would vote for the Democratic candidate. And conversely, I think Trump's team, as we reported, is going to be looking for people that, um, men predominantly, and also trying to look for people who come from a working class background, who maybe are civil servants, are like police officers, firefighters, sanitation workers. But they're also going to be trying to look for people who may have been felt that they've been wronged in the past mm -hmm. by the criminal justice system. I mean, Donald Trump has routinely said that this is a witch hunt, that he's being um, persecuted by elected officials in New York City. And though many of the prospective jurors cannot relate to that specifics, they may have in their life or in a family member's life felt that they've been wronged by the criminal justice system. Yeah. So trying to find people that can, they can relate to on that front. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's exactly what they'll be looking for. Michael Cohen is the fly in the ointment. This is the guy that got screwed. He doesn't have the sex with McDougal or Daniels. He doesn't become president and move down to Washington and write cover up checks from the Oval Office. He is the guy that takes out the home equity loan and sits in prison. Yeah, I spoke to Michael a few hours ago and he's very emboldened. I remember visiting in prison and, and he was telling me that the, the Bragg's people were coming up the next day. I mean, the amount of hours that he's been prepping for this. I mean, it, like he on the one hand, he cannot wait to get back and get, you know, vindication, frankly. And, and uh, this is he, his life was ruined because of Donald Trump, because to your point, of all the things he did on his behalf, not for his own behalf. And he also, you know, was kind of worn down. It's just like he can't get out. You know, he served his time, he paid his dues, he took responsibility, and still he's paying lawyer's fees and he's doing all these things. But he, he's ready to go. He knows he's going to get grilled, but he knows there's corroboration. There's not just my word against your word. There's, as you talked, as Lonnie talked about this morning on Morning Joe. Um, so he's ready to go. Let me show you, let me show folks that um, this is uh, Cohen's lawyer, Lenny Davis, who's got a little bit of visibility into how this case was put together. What other witness or witnesses do you think will most clearly corroborate his testimony? Well, I'm going to answer your question according to public reports, because I was in the room with Michael for almost two years while the prosecutors were preparing. I know. Case. 
I can tell you that there is another major crime that Michael was forced to plead guilty to, even though he really had nothing to do with it other than papering it. And that involved the National Enquirer mm -hmm. and somebody named David Pecker. David Pecker testified in front of the grand jury that he met, and that's the word federal prosecutors used in their memorandum, he met with, Trump met with David Pecker to do a cash and kill scheme where the National Enquirer would pay off anyone coming with bad information about Donald Trump before the election. So so Michael Cohen, Donnie, has been in the public eye, but, but the National Enquirer piece of this hasn't. Just remind folks what this is. Yeah, basically, a catch and kill is basically a bad story is going to come out, and you go to the publisher of the story, and you either you offer up something in return to kill the story. And Trump was friendly with David Pecker, and this story was killed, and I think that's, that's going to come out a lot in this case. And, you know... Again, we should say that this doesn't happen at the New York Times. It happens at the National yeah, Enquirer. Yes, yes. This, this is, Alvin Bragg has made clear that this is not, and the, the judge has made clear as well in the instructions to, to the jurors, this is about cheating. And that is a much simpler story. And it does, it does sort of muck up, I think, the tried and true Trump strategy of I'm just like you. Well, look, it kind of, um, kind of reminds me of Al Capone and getting him on taxes. It's, yeah. The, the, the crime alleged is something that I think even a lot of supporters of Donald Trump would not have trouble believing was happening, and which has been corroborated in other contexts, the method, the motive, catch and kill, the hush money payments. So Karen McDougal is an example of this is the means by which Donald Trump gets rid of problems. It attests to that. Um, but beyond that, I, this trial has a feel of like the season finale or the series finale of Seinfeld, where like everybody from Seinfeld's past comes to the jury box. It's like it's gonna be right. Hope Hicks. It's gonna be his former assistant in the White House. And Lane Davis is in this. I mean Cohen. And they're all coming to say this is actually how it works. This yeah. is actually how it goes down. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the app store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.